I guess we'll get started here. Uh, thank you again for joining us for another place or webinar. Uh, topic today is the state of restaurant real estate, uh, something that is near and dear to both myself and our, our guest today, Emily Durham from JLL, uh, something that both of us have spent a lot of time looking at and uh, breaking down. Emily, would you mind introducing yourself for the group that maybe hasn't seen you in one of our webinars before? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to talk about this with you. Um, my name is Emily Durham. I am based out of Houston. I work for JLL and am um, a senior vice president with their food and beverage advisory brokerage team. So pretty much really only focus 100% of our team's time on restaurant real estate. Thank you. And uh, for those who don't know me, don't adjust your screens. This is not Ethan Ternoski. I am RJ Hadavi. <laughs> I'm the head of analytical research at Playaser AI. You've probably seen me on previous webinars, but uh, I'll be running the uh, the webinar discussion today. So just a quick idea of what we're going to talk about today. As always, we'll start off with a quick introduction on Placer AI and what it is we do and how we get our data. Then we'll spend some time on just overall industry trends across the restaurant space. I think it's always helpful to have that discussion before diving into the fun stuff, taking a look at uh, some of the bigger picture trends in re restaurant real estate. And then lastly, we'll follow up with some Q&A if there is time. So briefly, what is Placer AI and how do we get our data? Well, Placer AI is a location-based analytics company powered by mobile data. What that means is we can come up with estimates for any physical property in the U.S., whether it's an individual restaurant location, retail, convention center, hotel, airport, uh, anything you can draw a shape around on a map, we have a way of coming up with foot traffic estimates for it. We partner with mobile app companies and put a little bit of code in that app and now partner with several dozen of those companies, a lot of times exclusively, uh, where they provide us 24-7 data on the devices uh, with those applications. Applications. All the data is completely anonymized, all aggregated. There's no way we get information about the individual user of that data. Um, but again, just the, the pings on that device. At this point, we've amassed a panel of about 25 million devices, which represents about 8 to 10% of the U.S. population. From there, our data scientists come up with an algorithm that allows us to estimate the uh, foot traffic for that uh for that physical property. We work with a lot of restaurant, retail, and commercial real estate companies, and we've tested our data against ours. Uh, theirs generally comes in about 95% accurate with ground truth data. But more importantly, we're more than just a foot traffic analytics company too. We do much more than just foot traffic. And the beauty of what we do is we partner with a lot of other data providers to offer you know, other insights, uh, you know, things like demographic data we can do through Census Data Bureau, a Census Bureau data, as well as uh, pop stats. Uh, we can do things like visitor journey. We can do things like um, market share or event studies or other things like that. So uh, not place or not just the foot traffic tool, we do a lot more of that and can tell you the full story behind any location. So with that, let's turn over to the fun stuff and let's look at some of the industry trends here. And so I thought we'd start today about just looking at where we where we are in terms of year over year traffic for the restaurant category. Now we started pretty strong in January. That was part of the Omicron lap that we started. Um, you know, and started to see things dwindle as we kind of went through the year. Um, I think there's a couple messages within this data here. One is I think that the impact that we've seen from inflation and other uh, discretionary spending headwinds, uh, consumers are spending a lot on essentials, and that's left less room for discretionary spend. And generally speaking, that's where restaurants fall. Um, there are some things we'll show here, but this is just kind of setting the stage that you know, we did see a little bit of recovery in June, but since then we've seen a little bit of fall off here. And Emily, is that generally tracking with what you've seen across the space here? I mean, it's so interesting because while that may be the general trend, we simultaneously are seeing an increase in demand for restaurant space on the real estate side of things. So it's pretty um, it's pretty fascinating to watch and kind of hard to figure out how um, you know that the, there's demand going through the roof. And Mark, we have four percent vacancy in Houston for retail in general. Um, so there are segments that are clearly down in sales but no shortage of people wanting to come to the market. So I think it you know, begs some bigger questions about um, brands and segments. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. I think this is one of those charts that can be a little bit misleading because I think if you break it down by segment, by market, um, and really I think that's what you have to do. And we'll cover a lot of that when we get into the real estate portion of this as well. Uh, I think that's where we do start to see a lot of these interesting stories because that we're seeing as well with our commercial real estate customers, there is demand for restaurants. There is demand for this kind of entertainment aspect of the uh, uh, the malls. And so uh, I think it is interesting to look at. So that's one of those ones that you can't just look at strictly just the overall category data. We have to dig a couple layers deeper which is exactly what we're going to do. 
Um, so what I thought we'd start with is kind of looking at that, you know, segment uh, growth numbers, uh, or the restaurant numbers uh, break, broken down by segments. And, you know, this is going back 12 months. But again, we see that same trend. We see the big spike in January for Omicron and then starting to see a deceleration. But we start to see a little bit of separation when we break it out between limited service restaurant concepts and full service restaurant concepts um, with the uh, the limited service players like QSR and Fast Casual, and especially coffee holding up well. Um, yeah, I think there's a few things behind that. I think we're generally seeing like we're seeing across much retail, a flight to more value oriented uh, you know, uh, concepts. And, and that's certainly the case with QSR. There's also a little bit, I think, uh, the return to office recovery in there as well. That's been, you know, gradual recovery in the amount of people coming back to the office that we've seen uh, as the years progressed. It's still holding about 65% in terms of the number of visits, uh, you know, currently compared to pre-pandemic levels. So I think that's a bit it. Um, you know, same time too, we've seen casual dining and fine dining down. It was interesting because fine dining is was actually holding up a little bit better at certain points uh, when we looked last year and started to reverse a bit. There's some stories behind that too, because we, and I guess I'll just kind of, you know, get ahead of it here a little bit, but, uh, you know, we do see a lot of strong visits to uh, fine dining at certain event periods. It's kind of the shoulder periods a little bit weaker. Casual dining's um, been, you know, just soft in general too. We have seen some pickup there as well um, during event periods, but that's, I think, largely, again, the idea of discretionary spending uh, being a little bit down for companies again. And I think if we looked at different markets, Markets, we can see different trends, but again, Emily, is this kind of you know your uh, your general take here too? Is it, or do you have anything else that you you're seeing here in the data that that you you want to call out? Yeah, absolutely. We've never seen so many coffee users in a market ever, and um, I I think the most useful piece I have read on this was from Placer. You guys did a white paper about coffee, and really there was an absolute shift in consumer behavior. There's been a trend of consumers going to the specialty coffee places at lunchtime, not just at, at breakfast. So there's a finite shift in how customers are using um, coffee spots. Yeah, I think that's right too, and we've heard that from other players as well. Um, that a lot of a lot of competition for those pad sites, especially as more and more people. Uh, or more and more coffee chains start to move the suburbs and and really embrace the drive through idea. I think that's exactly right. And um, it's interesting too the swings we've seen in coffee. Coffee had a really big 2021 as we were starting to come out of the pandemic. Was down a little bit last year, and I think a lot of that was the repositioning. A lot of the coffee chains started to embark and in, in, in moving out to the suburbs. And we've seen a real strong resurgence. I think a lot of that is uh, some of the new openings, some of the new locations, and some of the relocations that we've seen. So I think that. By the way, a question did come in whether or not these uh, slides. Will be made available. They will be made available after the uh, the presentation today. So be on the lookout for an email from from either Ethan, myself, or one of our other representatives. Yeah, and I think people are going to coffee spots for lunch more than ever, and um, and we're seeing them step up their options as far as their menus go. That's, that's a great point too. Something we are seeing, uh, something our data is showing is that, you know, we, we like to look at trends that, you know, what are the trends that happened during the pandemic that are sustainable, which were just, you know, things that happened during the pandemic. And one of those trends certainly was that idea of more late morning and early afternoon visits to coffee mm -hmm. as people were commuting less. That's been interesting because that has held pretty well. I mean, we've seen a bit of recovery that early morning as the morning commute. Uh, but again, with only 65% of people going back to the office or 60, 65% return visits, 80% percent visitors, um, there's still room for that morning and late early afternoon day part. So I agree with you. We're seeing the same trends for, for coffee, but certainly we could probably spend a whole another uh, you know, webinar on what's going on in coffee and maybe coffee. we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just because I think this helps with the uh, the real estate equation here too, I thought I'd just show one more slide here with uh, year over four year data for the uh, for the category. And what's interesting here, I want to jump out, get ahead of it because I think everyone's probably looking at the August month and seeing QSR way down. Um, there was four years ago a lot of promotions. McDonald's was running a buy one get one free burger promotion, so that I don't think is reflective of overall you know something major deceleration in trends or closings like that. That is just a tough year over four year comparison. But what I think is interesting here is if we look at the data. Um, you know, again, the idea that, you know, most of the chains are down year or four year, uh, with the exception of being coffee. Um, a lot of that is just the closures that we saw across the board. Um, you know, and again, QSR was not immune to that too. We did see concepts like KFC, you know, uh, you know, try 
to optimize our real estate and Pizza Hut, uh, close some locations as well. So there's some of that is just kind of location uh, shedding or moving to different locations. But that's what largely the year before year numbers are there is largely locations being shut down. But I think that helps to frame the conversation. Yes, we've seen a decline in the number of restaurants, but yet, Emily, you're saying that we're seeing an increase in demand for restaurants. And I think the way to bridge the gap is where people have moved to, where, where people are these days. It's kind of the markets and the areas within certain markets that we're seeing a lot more demand. So that's kind of, I think, what we're seeing primarily within. And maybe that's, uh, I mean, that, hopefully that's kind of what you're seeing as well. Yeah, I totally agree. When we study, I'm in Houston, when we study the overall Houston market and look at alcohol sales and look at restaurant sales, it is very clear that there's only certain parts of this city that can achieve over a certain level of sales. And so it's not, this is aggregate data, but you know, there's also other correlations then that have to do with that. The, the concentrated areas that will accept fine dining at a higher price point might also be those areas where people take summer vacations, more summer vacations. And of course you're gonna see an August decline, but it, there really are concentrations and we haven't started to talk about the fast casual trend as it relates to office yet, but um, there's definitely concentrations of the different categories in very specific areas. Yeah. One question did come in, and uh, since we can't get away from specialty coffee, we, we, we got one more on this one too. Just if we've looked at anything about you know time spent at specialty coffee and whether or not we can look at if it's um, you know, potentially workers you know, uh, workers working at home coming in and working at coffee shops, or if it just is kind of lunchtime visitors. Uh, we've looked a little bit at dwell time. And what's interesting too is with the movement towards more, um, you know, uh, mobile ordering and um, uh, drive through, I think we've actually seen dwell time go down for specialty coffee category, um, which leads me to believe it is a lot of office workers who are just trying to do something quick. Although, I mean, in certain cases too, um, I think we have to really look at a segmentation. Uh, you know, Starbucks, for example, has really gone out and decided which one of the locations are going to be more focused on convenience and which ones are going to be fo more focused on experience just because they realize that the need state is very different for those. So um, Emily, do you have any thoughts on that too? Something you've seen in terms of coffee visitation, dwell time, and if you guys have looked at, you know, who are office workers that maybe are working from home coming in that later day part, maybe if any of uh, the color that you have on that, on that, that front. Yeah. I mean, I think especially with, um, you know, the use of a lot of placer data to analyze, I think we're seeing, um, shorter dwell times at coffee um, as evidenced, if nothing else, by the fact that we have more and more people looking for double drive throughs A double drive through was never a thing before. Yeah. And so now we have to, when we're doing real estate, smaller buildings, larger drive throughs And, you know, I think that that just proves that more people are going for delivery. I think the number, um, the last number I saw was that drive throughs are up to 70% of total sales for QSR and coffee. Yeah, and that's that's tracks with what I've seen, and that compares to about sixty percent pre pandemic. And we've got actually that's a perfect segue to, um, and, and we will be talking about drive through on one of the later slides. Um, this is a something that I just caught my eye when I was thinking about it too. Is this is tracking all those five categories that we just had on the previous slide between QSR, fast casual, specialty coffee, uh, and then the full service dining, both casual dining and fine dining. And you know the thing that jumps out is like if you look back in 2017, we were roughly call it you know forty percent full service restaurant visitations and then uh, sixty percent uh, quick or limited service and that includes QSR fast casual and specialty coffee and if we look you know post pandemic I mean I think everyone assumes and you know rightfully so that we did see a shift to, to more of the you know limited service you know uh, a lot of the full service chains weren't able to operate during the pandemic uh, and certainly had to adjust the way they operated their businesses and where we where we shake out now is actually we're about thirty percent um, full service restaurants, and then about 70% uh, quick service restaurants or limited service restaurants. Um, and if you think about that, you know, almost, uh, you know, five to 10 point shift in visitations across the board really gives you an idea. I mean, and, and if you think about, you know, restaurants as a, as a bit, I mean, it's one of the largest retail categories that we have, you know, just behind grocery, really, um, you know, it's one of the massive categories. And if you think about that major shift in visitation trends, uh, really kind of underscores how much consumer behavior came out of that. Um, and with that behavior, Behavior, uh, that obviously has a ripple effect across the the real estate industry, as, I, as I'm sure you might agree there, Emily. And you know, certainly that you, you hinted at with drive through, and, and certainly that's a topic we'll get into. But you know, what's your take on this? Yeah, so I think you have a couple of things working sort of against each other at the same time here. I think post pandemic we have more people that want to do drive through, but post pandemic with the economy um, and prices in general, consumer pricing increasing. 
the most sensitive market to that is going to be the QSR market. So we yeah. sort of have this battling, um, these battling trends of people wanting to spend less more, needing to spend less, less money, but wanting to drive through. So it's really an interesting time. Yeah, you bring up a good point. Something that was interesting to watch last year is, uh, and I think I've mentioned this on previous webinars, but it was March of uh, 22 was really kind of the trigger point for for changes in consumer behavior. That was, you know, the period where consumers had been dealing with a lot of food, both food at home and food away from home inflation. Um, and then we, you know, and also on top of that, rent and healthcare costs were up. And then we saw that big spike in gas. And it was at that point, consumers kind of raised the white flag. All right, I, I've had enough. I'm not going to spend more. And we typically, when we start to see that kind of, you know, cyclical downturn or, you know, push back or pull back in consumer spending, we typically see QSRs outperform as people kind of shift to value. And we did see that. But what was interesting is about midway through the year, uh, July or so, is when we started to see a lot of the QSR chains start to raise prices to offset their own inflation, labor costs, things like that. And there was almost an immediate pushback. Like all of a sudden, that gap we saw between full service and quick service restaurants almost evaporated overnight. And so it was pretty amazing to see. And it really took a lot of the promotional activity and not just discounting, but a lot of the celebrity meals and you know the adult happy meal that McDonald's ran last October, um, you know September. Those were the things that kind of got people back to the QSR space. But it was interesting to see how quickly consumers respond to pricing in this environment. So, and again, this will all have a ripple effect when we get to the real estate portion of the uh, the presentation here. You'd hinted at this uh, before, Emily, just the, the blurring of the lines, the QSR and fast casual. I thought that was super interesting. One of the things, and uh, you know, we spoke about this on one of the previous webinars with um, you know with another restaurant analyst. But you know, the idea that you know fast casual kind of had this perception of being very different from QSR. You know, pre-pandemic, it was kind of more upscale. Um, you know, you know, the throughput could be a lot faster. You know, better quality, better ingredients, things like that. That kind of you know, was pioneered by Chipotle and others. Um, and if you looked at the visits per location, you know. You you did see a significant outperformance. You almost saw uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, outperformance per quarter from fast casual restaurants. It's interesting as we get to the pandemic, all of a sudden we see QSR uh, really take over. And, you know, in response, I think we're seeing a lot of the things that QSR brings to the table, whether it be mobile ordering or deliver or delivery or, you know, multiple drive through windows. All of a sudden we've got QSR that's outperforming fast casual. So I think, you know, we've seen the blurring of the lines between QSR and fast casual. And I, I think you can make a fair argument that they're pretty much the same at this point, too. So, um, you know, what, what's your take on, on fast casual versus QSR, Emily? Yeah, I mean, fast Fast casual only became a thing, I guess, with, you know, folks like um, Cafe Express, whenever that was 20 years ago. But yeah. uh, it's so common to see almost any brand, especially a chef driven brand, a higher end brand. Think about Wolfgang Puck and his fast casual. Everybody's doing fast casual, which simply means counter service. But yeah. now it's it's surpassed the quality of menu that it started with to absolutely everything. And I think there's always been sort of a psychology at play here, which drove consumer behavior to believe that if it's counter service, it's cheaper, or if it's counter service, that there's more value in what you're getting. And um, that's not always the case, but I think that uh, that was effective, effective in, in getting a lot of people in the door, like chains like La Madeline, um, you could probably spend just as much as you could at a at a sit down restaurant. It just feels like there's more value when you're walking through a line and um, and getting your food. But so at the end of the day, we're seeing the quality of menus and the quality of the offering in fast casuals is is really surpassing QSRs. Although there's certainly a lot of movement there in chains doing different things at a QSR level. Yeah, I think. Um... I think we've also seen some improvement on the QSR front too, in terms of uh, you know the menus there as well. I think that's part of what we're seeing in the narrowing the gap. But I do think a big part of it is too is that you know just consumer behavior about mobile ordering and pickup the way they did it, um, you know, it was was a major shift. And uh, you know we th see things like Chipotle lanes and uh, pickup windows, and and also I think a big part of this too is now a lot of the fast casual players are kind of following where consumers are going and following a more of a suburban strategy here as well. So some of that has picked up in the number as well. But certainly we've got more on that. And, and to comment on the real estate. Before we get to the, the real estate section, I just want to end up with one slide here. And I, I think this underscores another theme that we're seeing across the board in the consumer space. This is casual dining versus fine dining uh, on a week over or on a weekly basis going back to the beginning of the year. What's interesting, I mean, it's the same trends that we've shown, kind of that big start to uh, January um, and that trend down. But what's interesting, if you kind of go back and there's a couple of weeks here that you start to see uh, upticks in, in visitation trends. And if you go back, uh, well, we've got Valentine's Day, uh, we've got Easter, 
Easter, we've got Mother's Day, we've got Father's Day, we've got, you know, Fourth of July week was was big too. And so we're seeing these trends that, that actually, are, it's interesting, um, it's a very event-driven uh, consumer right now. If consumers are showing a willingness to spend around events. Um, and in fact, if we go look at visitation trends on the holidays this year, in a lot of cases, we're above where we were pre-pandemic in terms of visit per location or visit per square foot. Um, it's really the shoulder periods where people have shied back. And I think that's kind of reflective of what we've seen across the board in overall retail too. I think that that's kind of a th thing that we've seen from, you know, other mass merchants, other groups like that. Everybody seemed to have big holidays. It's kind of the shoulder periods a little bit softer. Um, and I think that's playing into some of the, uh, the things from a behavioral standpoint right now. Yeah, Emily, any, any thoughts there? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that if people are saving their dining out occasions for special holidays um, and, and cutting back. Yep. So let's get to the fun stuff. Let's get into the real estate stuff here, uh, the discussion. And, you know, I, I want you to take the lead on this one too, but, um, you know, because you mentioned early on that you're seeing uh, a lot of demand for restaurants, um, but availability is tough. And I, I think it dovetails nicely with some of the stuff we've looked at from a migration standpoint. You know, there are a lot of markets, uh, particularly in the South and Southeast, uh, that have seen a explosive population, south, southwest and southeast that have seen explosive population growth. Um, pretty much every major market in Texas, as you, you've seen, uh, Arizona, Florida, uh, the Carolinas, seen a lot of population growth. And I think that that's where some of this increased demand and less availability for restaurants is, is taking place. Is that something you're seeing? Uh, you maybe take the lead here, walk us through it here. A hundred percent. I mean, we, it, you know, with COVID, we saw the increase in population shifts to the Sun Belt states. And, you know, that's for a few different reasons. It's the weather, it's the business climate, climate, and so on and so forth. A lot of it during COVID was really the ability for restaurants to do business. And some areas of the country were easier than others. We, we didn't have closures that were as long, for example, in Texas as some other states did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we have mass influx of population to um, to Texas and Florida. And of course, the Phoenix area, um, Scottsdale couldn't be any busier as a market um, in general. And so what sort of happened after that then is we no longer just have local Houston folks or local Texas folks expanding through Texas. Now we have people who are coming to, to try out Texas business from California and from other states. And so we have operators to add to the demand, operators from other states. We have operators from other countries. Um, JLL has quite a few international clients coming to Texas to start rolling out their brand in the United States. And, you know, there's only so many, uh, so many spots. Yeah, that's it's been interesting to look at, and it's consistent with what we've heard from a lot of the uh, the restaurant chains out there too. That you know we're looking for new markets. I mean, McDonald's announced on their second quarter uh, update that they're going to be looking to expand and open up new restaurants really for the first time in almost a decade. Um, it's kind of you know they, they've obviously opened up, but it's usually kind of a you know net neutral uh, in terms of openings. But they pointed out the South markets. Although if you look too, there's I think there's some attractive opportunities in some of the urban residential or urban urban centers that have started back as well but it's going to be interesting to see where we see uh, you know restaurants go and you know how we can get to more availability and more sites i think that could be interesting to see uh because there is certainly is not demand for for new restaurant locations with both commercial real estate operators we're talking to and restaurant uh owners uh, a lot more demand particularly in these markets so it's going to be interesting to see how this develops in the years to come for sure one of the other things that we've looked at too, and this is becoming a you know more uh, a, a bigger bigger topic within the restaurant industry, the idea of smaller markets becoming a, a more viable option. Um, you know, the Wall Street Journal published a, an article earlier this year with the help of some of our data, admittedly, so shameless plug there. Um, but looking at you know not only the overall visitation when a Chipotle goes to a small market, and you know smaller market it's defined as something under hundred thousand people, even as low as fifty thousand uh, people in that in that market. Um, um, and what we've done, we've shown that, that there is a lot more, um, you know, visits per location in those smaller markets. Um, it makes sense too. There's less competition in those markets. Um, you know, generally you have access to, uh, you, you get the first access to labor in those markets. People, people want to work for these brands that are coming to these smaller markets. 
um, generally cheaper to operate um, in terms of rent and uh, just overall costs in, in general. But essentially, too, one of the things that was was interesting when we saw Chipotle enter the market, there was a lot more cross visitation with kind of casual dining or full service dining. So that which makes sense because it's generally kind of a higher income consumer that's going into a Chipotle. So it would make sense that there's more overlap with the uh, the casual dining. So there's more more cross visitation with that. But where we saw the biggest impact was actually the QSR. Generally, the largest QSR player in those markets was the one that uh, got hit. But anyways, the long story short is that I, I think we are starting to see particularly migration trends and people moving more suburban and even rural. There's some, a lot more options in kind of smaller markets. Is that something you guys are seeing in JLL, Emily? We're, we're trying to see it. We have this conversation a lot, with, especially with our franchise clients. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said cheaper to operate. So that's what our conversation is about. Most, you know, a lot of the time, the first inclination is to come to the middle of um, an urban environment to, to establish a brand. However, it is totally doable to see the success like you're showing on your chart here by going to markets where the rent is less and the cost to operate is less. And I think we just need to spend more time running those numbers with um, with our clients for operators to take a look at um, alternatives. And of course, it's, you know, a lot of that is helped by the fact that people have moved outside of the cities, like you said, into the suburbs and even into rural areas. Yeah. Question came in. Uh, this one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw at you here, Emily. Um, question about high-end malls that cater to operating consumers experience a nice bounce back as of late. Is that inspiring restaurants to add locations in and near those high-end malls? Is this is a common theme throughout the U.S. or is this or is it taking place in the Phoenix and the, uh, the, uh, the southern markets that you're looking at? Could you say that one more time about inside the malls? Yeah. So, it's, you know, with, you know, generally speaking, we've seen a bifurcation in consumers right now. We've seen the higher end consumer holding up relatively well. And, you know, by extension of that, they are continuing to visit kind of these higher end locations mm -hmm. because of that resurgence. Are we seeing high end malls or more restaurant locations, you know, being added to high end malls or nearby, uh, particularly in those markets that we showed in terms of migration? You know, I, that's a really good question. And I, I spent a bunch of time on the phone with Simon, the Simon group this week talking about just that. I think, you know, and it depends where you are. I think it can be a challenge. And and I think that there were some shifts to the customer in some of the malls um, over the past few years. And we've certainly seen our share of fine dining restaurants in our local malls here. Um, but there's so many other factors that have to do uh, with the malls as well. And um, we're really trying to study that. For example, you know, when I think a lot of this data can be had from open table and such is that reservations don't necessarily change, but the surroundings do. So for example, here in Houston, when we have the NCAA in town for their tournament, um, and that's sort of generally located in the same area as our Houston Galleria, you know, people physically can't get to the mall. So there's a lot more factors at play there. And, um, you know, and then during COVID, we have diff we had different hours at, for the restaurants than for the mall. So yeah. I I know that mall owners, as well as um, other you know luxury hotel owners that are trying to put restaurants in, are trying to figure out the sweet spot there. Yeah, it's a, you bring a good point about the open table data. We just recently compared the, our fine dining visitation data to, to open tables and found, I think it was like a 98 or 99 percent correlation with their seated diner index that they publish in the U.S. So uh, they're seeing a lot of the same things that we are. And again, I think, you know, when you take a look at the overall number being down, I, I think, again, this is really a case in restaurants. You have to look market by market and really property by property. There's really um, to the question that came in. I think we are seeing some of those higher end malls continue to do very well. Again, if that's a bifurcation consumer and ex extension i think a lot of restaurants are um you know looking there um if there's a vi vi availability of those locations some of our commercial real estate customers have said that that's exactly what they want to fill um you know restaurants are good for business so while we may be painting kind of a negative picture overall of kind of visitation trends um i think the idea i mean i think the takeaway here really should be that there is a ton of demand uh for restaurant concepts uh and what's interesting too the other one too and i don't want to get too much sidetracked but one of the things we're seeing is that initially when the pandemic hit um we we showed that slide that we went from 60 percent visits uh 
you know, from 40% visits and full service to 30% visits. And initially it was all the large chains that were, you know, taking up that, they're taking visitation share of a smaller pie, but recently we've seen kind of resurgence in some of the, you know, kind of up and coming, you know, kind of more independent type of, you know, uh, restaurant chains or, or not just independents in general, I think are really starting to make a mark. And we've seen some uh, visitation share for some of the smaller chains that are starting to make the name too. So um, yeah, something that we're, we're seeing just with our data, just wanted to put it out there as well. Yeah, for sure. Um. So this is something, and again, shifting a little bit more back to the uh, the fast casual side of the equation, um, we are starting to see, I mean, this is kind of the idea of this migration away to sub suburban uh, and, and other markets. I mean, we're seeing this real, um, you know, real increase in a lot of loyalty among the suburban. I think, you know, we talked about fast casual seeing that, you know, kind of a nice year in terms of visitation trends. And I think this kind of explains a lot of it too. It's the idea that you're moving to suburban locations and you're now you're starting to see, now, now that you've moved there and you've been in there for those locations for more than a year in a lot of cases, now you're starting to see that repeat visit. Um, you know, again, this is going to skew towards when you're higher in, in income consumer, but I think it's really interesting to see the percentage of visitors who are coming in more than once, uh, you know, how far they're traveling to get to these uh, locations. So I think that also explains, you know, in addition to kind of that gradual office recovery or, um, or, or, or even that, but the idea of suburban locations for a lot of these chains too, um, I think we're seeing not only them move there, but now starting to see and capitalize on it as well. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. And, and when using placer data, it's always, it's always sometimes shocking, but always interesting to see how large the trade areas are, um, you know, because you think about restaurants and a three mile radius, but some of these trade areas are just enormous. And especially like you have Baybrook up here, 73 mile trade area. Once you see that, you make some different decisions about where you would put the same, the same operator. Yeah. Yep. Uh, another question came in that I missed, but I want to get back to because it it's a good one. Um, you know, talking about just the overall cost operate. Obviously, we showed that slide early on with migration to the Phoenix, the Dallas markets like that. Um, but obviously, those are expensive markets to, to operate in. Do you, do you think that's had an impact on growth um, of restaurants in those markets? Uh, Emily, I'm going to let you have that one because I think that's probably you know, something that you're probably better equipped to answer here. Well, it really depends because when we have people come to Houston from LA or New York City or London, our highest priced real estate is not going to be higher than what they paid in their market. So it really depends on where the operator is coming from. For people who are expanding throughout Texas and they've been in business for many years and they're used to um, you know, the terms of leases that they've always had, to them it's, it's a shock and it's hard to expand. So I really, it really depends on the operator and where they're coming from. But at the end of the day, it's all a formula. You need to make a you know, certain amount of money and have your occupancy cost be a certain percentage of that. And whichever way, whichever way you're measuring it from, it's, it's really just one formula. Yep. So you had hinted at this. This is something we've been looking at, uh, the idea of multiple drive through. And uh, I think that's kind of changed the game in a lot of ways for QSR. Um, yeah, the idea of three or four or even not even five drive through lanes. What's 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 next here? Um, you know, we're seeing it from a lot of chains. The idea of, you know, I, I think we've certainly, certainly seen it with groups like Duncan. We've seen it with Taco Bell. And, you know, Shake Shack's a company we've looked at in terms of, you know, they have started to open up drive through lanes. And what, what I've done here is they compared, um, you know, a drive through location in Orlando uh, versus their next closest location. And you really do see a, a meaningful impact, um, you know, the, in terms of the, the visitation trends really kind of shows you this, you know, and really drives home this idea of changes in consumer behavior and, um, you know, what's going on there. I mean, what's, what's your take on, on kind of the multiple drive through lane? And, you know, you obviously hinted at the idea there's more competition, less space for the actual restaurant, more space for drive through. What's, what's your kind of take on the whole situation here? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing more and more demand for it and um, not a huge, not a huge supply of the availability of double and triple drive through areas. Um, and so we're seeing more people trying to take down pad sites or you know, build new buildings. We look at excess capacity in parking lots of large anchors like Walmart to maybe drop these things in. But I don't think that the interest in this is going to wane at any time soon. I will just say, on the real estate side, if you're a landlord, you know traditionally you're charging a per square foot rent for your building. And so, as technology increases here and our buildings get smaller, but our outdoor drive-throughs get larger. I think that the general real estate industry has to 
start making some changes as well. We're no longer going to be working off of the same metrics because we're now talking about outdoor space that is a premium. Yeah, that's a great point. Something we've heard uh, other uh, other groups talk about too, the, the need to change the the metrics in terms of way way leases are, are constructed yeah. in, together in this, in this day and age. I think that's a great point to bring up. So we we kind of touched on this with the earlier question, but just um, you know the uh, the overall mall situation too. So if we kind of look at where malls are, um, you know the the actual visit duration um, is up in a lot of cases for malls, and I think that might start to speak to the idea that we have started to see more and more restaurants at malls. The overall visit numbers are generally down for most of the malls across different types, but if we look at kind of the overall time spent there, uh, that is up, and I think a lot of that speaks to not only not only restaurant, but obviously we've seen a lot of changes in terms of mixed use and other things that malls are being used for. Um, I, I saw an article yesterday describing you know, malls as almost many cities at this point, yeah. uh, which is an interesting way to, to, to frame it and kind of interesting to think about uh, how the role of the mall has changed. But is that something, you know, how much do you think is restaurants? How much do you think is other? I mean, my, my take is restaurants are a big part of the duration lift that we've seen for a lot of these uh, locations for a lot of mall properties these days. Is that kind of your general take or do you see it differently? Yeah, and I mean, especially for lifestyle centers, we have been looking at the dwell times of a lot of our most popular newer projects, and the newer projects are generally going to be more like a lifestyle center than an indoor mall, and um, they have, the dwell time is increased because of, of the tenant mix, so you can eat, you could also drink, you might do some shopping, um, one of our, our local um, newer lifestyle centers had a dwell time of 80 minutes, and that was longer than retail that's been around Houston for 40 years. So we're definitely seeing, um, and and that probably is correlated with uh, generation and the age of the current customer that's going to the malls, but definitely a lot of, a lot of different things happening in that one visit. Yeah. No, I agree with you too. I think we've seen that, um, you know, multi-purpose and, you know, multi-function visit, is, I think is a major trend. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just in the sake of time here. Uh, but you and I were talking about this before, uh, before we hopped on and, and let everybody in here. This was something that uh, both of us were kind of, you know, formulating some hypothesis on. Uh, Eatertainment had been kind of a big story in the, the overall restaurant space in 22, kind of this reopening, people wanting to be out and finding activities and things to do. And the idea of Eatertainment, so your top golf, your main event, Dave and Buster's, had a big year in 2022 and a, a nice start to the year in 2023. But again, we started to see that tail off. And um, my, at least my, my thought is why, you know, why we're seeing this is one is we're, we are seeing some tougher comparisons. I mean, if you look at kind of visits compared to pre-pandemic, most of the, um, you know, entertainment locations are still ahead of where they were pre-pandemic. But I think this summer too, we've seen, you know, obviously the Barbenheimer phenomenon. So people have had more options in terms of, you know, entertainment choices. Theme parks have had a nice, at least July and August. So I think that there's other options out there. Um, but yeah, and I, I don't want to say entertainments. I mean, it's, you know, you're over your trends may look a little bit negative, but I still think there is very much a place for entertainment within the overall restaurant ecosystem. And what's your what's your take on entertainment here, Emily? Yeah, this is a little bit hard to understand as we were talking about because I mean the demand from and the 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 introduction of new entertainment concepts does not seem to be letting up at all. No. Um, when we list a space that's conducive to an entertainment type concept, we have multiple parties interested. A lot of them new. And, you know, I think there's probably, a, you know, a bunch of different factors at work here. It is probably a more expensive experience to take your family out to an entertainment evening than just to a movie or just a dinner. Um, they tend to get a little bit expensive. But, you know, the other thing is we sort of, we've had record heat um, in the south part of the United States this summer. And we did not, my family did not go to Top Golf. <laughs> so I've also been having a lot of conversations like with our Texas Restaurant Association folks, um, those down in Galveston. It's just a dip in everybody's sales this summer because of extreme heat and yeah. people not wanting to go outside and then traveling outside of these cities that are so hot. 
It was interesting too. We, you're exactly right. I mean, we've seen heat, uh, the extreme heat manifests itself a little bit differently across the board. Uh, we did notice some of the QSR chains that are kind of more beverage centric, the ones that kind of have the cooler drinks, the the, the slushy type things like that. They actually had performed. We had, did see a little bit of a spike in fat casual dining in that period too. And we, basically the thesis we came up with is people just wanted air conditioning and, and yeah, too, exactly. less, less going to top golf, but going in still eating out just to get some air conditioning. Um, I think you bring up a good point because I don't think entertainment is something you can write off. I think this is just tougher year over year trends. But as I mentioned, year over four year trends, particularly on a visit per location basis, uh, most of the entertain con entertainment concepts are well ahead of where they were. I, I think you're exactly right. I think there's tremendous demand and not just kind of the more you know physical activity ones, you know, groups like a Kura Sushi, things like, or, um, you know, things like that, uh, it, where you, you're more involved with the meal itself. I think there's, there's tremendous amount of demand and people are still looking for that. So um, don't want to, don't want to, you know, put a negative light on entertainment. I think No, just, not at all. And I think that the whole experience experiential trend is very, very important right now. And we see concepts like Meow Wolf starting to move across the country. It's sort of like starting with entertainment, this keeps evolving. And as we go, the, the technology increases, the option increases, the, the what the experience is keeps morphing as we go so that there's always something new. And yep. um yep. so Yep. We've got one more topic I want to cover, cover in a couple of slides. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing across space, and it kind of almost dovetails a little bit into this, uh, this entertainment concept is the idea of new sources of competition. I, I put this on here being, uh, you know, Houston based and, you know, a grocer near and dear uh, to, to your area as HEB, you know, was opening up, um, you know, a hundred thousand square foot location in Lake Austin, where it's got multiple uh, restaurant concepts within the uh, the location itself. And it's something we've seen from hy V, it's something we've seen from a couple other chains as well. Well, the idea of kind of blurring of the lines between grocery and restaurant. Um, and what's interesting on the next slide, we've actually looked at kind of the percentage of weekend visits for that particular location, at least earlier in the year, um, and they get a lot more weekend visits. And I think that this could be a new source of competition across the board. Some of the things that we're seeing in terms of uh, large format grocer that are going after a larger target audience, um, you know, some, something we're seeing there. And then the other one that's interesting too is C stores. I think we're starting to see this as, a, as more competition for QSR and What's been interesting too is the ones that are really invested, the C sort chains that have invested a lot in food platforms. So a Wawa or Sheets, those are the groups that are really seeing the biggest increases in visitation, particularly the ones that have kind of re replicated the QSR formula with a pickup window um, or mobile ordering even. What's interesting too is that the what time they're picking up the share from too the uh, the evening day part seems to be where the C stores are picking up a lot more share all of a sudden um, both you know kind of early evening and late evening uh, so it's interesting too that we may be seeing some and I think this is probably more lower income consumers but it's interesting to see the shift um, away from you know kind of the the evening day part for some of these QSR chains as well or uh, where we may be eating in so what's your take on overall competition from grocery and C stores for the uh, for the restaurant space. Yeah, I think that, and as we talked about before the call, there was a while where the price of grocery store items was increasing faster than the price of restaurant menus, and we've sort of started to see a reverse happening. So I think there's going to be more uh, traffic going to grocery stores just because it's back to being a little less expensive for some folks than the restaurants. But again, I have to believe that some of the, the stuff like increases in C-store popularity is generational. My daughter goes in college in Phil, outside of Philadelphia, and all she does is go to Wawa. <laughs> that's what she does. That's what her friends do. They like the food. And, um, of course, there's there's a component of the, these guys stepping up their game a little and what they're offering. But um, maybe it's the the quickness of it. But I think that it's it's popular with a certain age group. Yeah, I think you're right there, too. I think it is generational. There's a big part of that as well. So um, I, I think you kind of nailed it there. So with that, I think we're actually out of time. We're actually a little bit over time today. So uh, if we didn't get to your questions, I apologize. Feel free to reach out to me if you still do have questions or um, or anything else you want to talk about. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be making uh, the recording of this webinar available to everybody today. We will send out the slides as well. Um, but thank you again, Emily. This is always a, a great discussion. Um, you know, any, any parting thoughts for the group here? Uh, you know, we really want you to keep going out to eat. <laughs> 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think that is the takeaway. And um, supporting your neighborhood places. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, um, even though there's been a lot of changes in consumer behavior, there's been a lot of changes in where consumers live. Um, I think the ones, the concepts that are are, are meeting the, the consumers in those markets, the ones that are kind of adapting behavior are very strong. And in most cases, uh, they're seeing visit per location, you know, ahead of where we were pandemic. So there are a lot of success stories in the restaurant space. And I think to your point earlier, the demand from commercial uh, property owners right now is real. I think there is a tremendous amount of demand for, for new restaurant concepts and even existing restaurant concepts that are still innovating. So Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and uh, hope to see you again on a future Placer uh, AI webinar. Thank you.